Now there's an introduction for um, Magda Havas. She's a great lecturer and has done really good research, and um, I thought she would be a, one of the more engaging people to bring in on a subject that's very controversial and uh, very important for people in the country to hear about, which is electro-hypersensitivity, or EHS. She is an environmental toxicologist at Trent University in Canada, and she did postdoctoral research at Cornell and served on the International Joint Commission as a member of the Task Force on Emerging Issues between U.S. and Canada. Her previous research dealt with chronic, chem I'm sorry, chemical contaminants in the environment, and for the past 20 years, she's been studying the harmful and beneficial effects of non-ionizing electromagnetic frequencies. She works with people who've developed hypersensitivity to electric electricity, and her research involves determining both the ways to objectively diagnose this illness and ways to help people heal. Magda? Thank you very much. It's a real honor for me to be here and to uh, address this audience. I'm going to be talking about electrosmog, which I believe is the missing link when it comes to a lot of chronic illnesses, uh, including cancers, reproductive problems. But I'm going to limit my talk today just to electrohypersensitivity because it's something that's not well understood in North America. Electrohypersensitivity, I had originally, is an emerging health issue. I think it's actually emerged. It's really quite serious, and I use the acronym EHS, and I realized in this audience EHS means something quite different. Um, so EHS, when I use it, is electrohypersensitivity, and we could certainly use an institute, a National Institute of Electrohypersensitivity. When it comes to non-ionizing electromagnetic fields, it falls into four different categories, low-frequency electromagnetic fields and radio-frequency microwaves. And I went to the NIEH website and found that you do actually have information on both of those. But there's other parts of the spectrum that need to be looked at as well. Intermediate frequencies is a very serious one. So is ground current in certain parts of the United States. Um, and I'm going to be introducing some of these as well. Our exposure to wireless technology and electrosmog has increased dramatically. These are the different places in uh, the United States that used Wi-Fi back in 2002, mostly research labs and universities. Within 10 years, this is what the map looks like, and it's getting worse. So our exposure to this radiation is increasing quite dramatically, and it's not only Wi-Fi. When I did my research, I didn't realize that there were actually more cell phones in the United States than the population. Um, and you couldn't have s said that 10 years ago. I also uh, looked at the NIEHS website on electromagnetic fields to find out what was available and came up with absolutely nothing. So this illness, which I think is incredibly important, this pollutant, which I think is incredibly important, is really being ignored by a lot of uh, federal agencies here in the United States and also in my country and Canada. In 2004, I attended a meeting of the World Health Organization. They had a special workshop on electrohypersensitivity, and they said EHS is a real and debilitating pro problem, and it occurs at levels well below our, our guidelines. The guidelines in North America are based on a heating effect, nothing else. They're absolutely out of date. The symptoms of EHS uh, affect all of our organs and tissues. Um, they induce inflammation, as uh, Bill just said. They affect the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the skin, the eyes, digestion, all of those. And I'm just going to pick four examples that I'd like to share with you in this very brief presentation. So I'm going to present four case studies and a form of electromagnetic pollution that affects them. This is all my own research, it's all been published, it's all been peer reviewed, and I'd be happy to provide references to anyone who might be interested in this. And I'm going to start with multiple sclerosis. A few years ago, I started working with people who have multiple sclerosis to find out if we reduce the electrosmog in their home, whether or not their symptoms would recover, thinking that the nervous system is electromagnetic, our exposure is electromagnetic. And I was getting such amazing results that I thought no one is going to believe the results. Indeed, I actually thought it was a placebo effect, and I thought, my God, this placebo effect is very powerful. So I started videotaping the people I work with. This is a 40-year-old woman who has secondary progressive MS. I went to her home back in 2004, and I asked her to hold her hands out. Um, she is really very debilitated by the MS. 
And this is trying to hold her hands straight. So she can't feed herself. She can't go to the bathroom by herself. We cleaned up something in her home that I call Agent X. And six weeks later, these were her symptoms. She hadn't changed any of the medication she was on. And we were getting this type of response in some cases in, within a couple of days and in some cases within a couple of weeks. Agent X happens to be intermediate frequencies. So we didn't get rid of the radio frequency in her home. We didn't get rid of low magnetic fields. Uh, we actually got rid of intermediate frequencies that are in the kilohertz range, so thousands of cycles per second. And the main culprit in her home was a plasma TV. Plasma TVs are notorious for this. They can be resolved by simply putting in a filter in the TV set that reduces this frequency. But because uh, so few people recognize that it's biologically active, there's no regulations to ensure that this is done. This is another person with MS, um, and this is an MRI scan showing the lesions in the brain. Uh, this was back in 2001. Seven years he was living without intermediate frequencies or much lower levels, and you can see that the, the uh, sclerosis has um, disappeared. And this is not a placebo effect, it's not psychological, it's really happening to people. And so this is good news, if you reduce your exposure you can actually recover. The second example I'd like to give is dealing with diabetes, and we know that diabetes is becoming a pandemic. Um, the number of type 2 diabetics especially is increasing. Now, if you're either a type 1 or a type 2 diabetic and you suffer from electrohypersensitivity, I've classified that as a type E diabetic, which means there's an environmental trigger that will affect your blood sugar. And I'm going to show you just one example. This is a 57-year-old woman who's a type 2 diabetic, doesn't take any medication. This shows you her blood sugar. And the way that she recovers her blood sugar is by exercise. She goes for a 20-minute walk. And in a 20-minute walk, you can see here that her blood sugar before the walk shown in gray and after a 20-minute walk shown in green does exactly what it's supposed to do. It comes down. We're using up the uh, glucose. When she does a walk and is exposed to Agent X, this is what happens to her blood sugar. It actually goes up. And it goes up quite consistently. Agent X happens to be a treadmill that produces intermediate frequencies and high um, magnetic fields as well. Third example is looking at live blood. And this is my own blood that I'm going to be showing you. Um, my home, my work environment has low EMFs. I did that deliberately because I know what the long-term consequences of exposure are. And then I expose my body to three different agents, and this is what happened to the live blood. Now at the bottom here, you can see the red blood cells are aggregating, they're sticking together, and when they stick together in a coin-like formation, we call that rouleau. So Agent X happens to be um, pulsed electromagnetic field mat that is used to improve circulation. And you can see how the nice the blood cells are actually staying apart. It actually increases the electrical potential charge on the cells so they're repelling each other. Agent Y happens to be a computer that's not um, in, in Wi-Fi mode. So this is just a regular computer plugged in using Ethernet connections and Agent Z as a, as a cordless phone. So when my blood is exposed to this, it goes into rouleau formation, which is not good. The consequences of this are actually quite obvious, I think, to everyone here, but there are some other more serious consequences. Um, the red blood cell aggregation has been associated with things like diabetes, stroke, uh, heart attacks, Alzheimer's disease, and quite a few other things as well. And the symptoms that people get if their blood sticks together um, are these. And so one of the benefits, I think, of live blood is that we might be able to use it as a diagnostic for people who are electrically hypersensitive. It won't work for everyone, but it will work for a handful of people. The last example I'd like to give you is dealing with heart attacks or anxiety attacks. Many of the people I work with who are electrically hypersensitive tell me that they go into a certain environment and suddenly their heart will start palpitating. And so what we've done is, you know, we can measure the heart. So we've done a study with 25 people from Colorado, and this is showing their heart rate variability results, uh, showing the number of beats of their heart rate, uh, 58, 56, and 58 beats during three three-minute segments. Now, this particular person was exposed to the Agent X during segment two, and you can see there's virtually no difference, no change in the heart rate or the heart rate variability, and this person was non-responsive. 
Here we have a very different response. This person is in a supine position, so they're lying down. We turn on agent X, and their heartbeat goes from 6 to 8 to 122 beats per minute when they're exposed, and it goes back um, to the normal baseline for them very, very quickly. And obviously, this is a highly responsive person, and what they're experiencing is tachycardia. Now, this was one of the more extreme examples. Usually, the heart rate will only go up 10 or 20 units rather than a, a doubling. And the agent here was a cordless phone base station. So for people in the audience who have one of these cordless phones, one of the things you should realize, it's emitting 24-7, whether you're using the phone or not. And if you have it next to your bed, you're exposed to microwave radiations on a regular basis. Now, one of the concerns we have about 2.4 gigahertz, which is the frequency of that phone, is that kids now that are attending schools where Wi-Fi has been introduced, they're beginning to suffer from uh, headaches, all sorts of problems, including heart problems. And in one of the schools in Ontario, when the parents started talking, we found out that after Wi-Fi was introduced into the school, quite a few of the kids had heart issues um, to the point where they were going to their pediatric cardiologist. And what the school did is they installed defibrillators. And when parents asked them if they would simply turn off the Wi-Fi for a month to see if there was any difference, um, they simply refused to do that. How many people have EHS? Well, I think about 3% of the population has severe symptoms and about 35% has mild to moderate symptoms. In the United States, that um, if those numbers are even close, we're talking about 9 to 100 million people. So we're talking about an incredibly large population. In um, Europe, uh, European Union, it's even worse. Now, I know um, kids' and children's uh, health is a really big issue here. And, you know, one of the things that I would absolutely love to come out of NIEHS is some warnings so that people can use the technology safely or in, or in a safer manner. For example, putting it in your pocket is not a good idea. Being pregnant and using your Wi-Fi-enabled uh, computer on your lap. We have baby monitors that basically work 24-7, emitting the infant to microwave radiation. In Europe, you can get um, sound-activated baby monitors. They're illegal in North America. We can't bring them in. The FCC actually uh, prevented them from coming in. We used to have them available. And when people try to import them, the companies there will say, we can't uh, send these to North America. So that needs to be changed. We have Wi-Fi in schools, and we have kids holding um, microwave transmitters next to their head. We can continue to ignore this. Levels are going up, and they're going to continue to go up. And I say that because last year, the federal communication actually made $45 billion selling parts of the spectrum to the wireless industry. And one of the things they've come up with um, are RF emitting uh, thermometers. So you put a soother in a child's mouth, and that will send the cell phone information about what the baby's temperature is. They have the same thing for diapers. The diaper will send the information to the mother's cell phone, telling them um, that the diaper is wet. So if we don't want cell phones, Next to the head, we certainly want a microwave transmitter inside an infant's mouth. We've had issues in the past, and we've resolved some of these already. Uh, E-smog, I think, is going to be the next big issue. And there's issues with both reproduction and cancer that I haven't talked about. Now, we've done some sperm studies as well. This hasn't been published yet. Uh, but there are over 20 reports showing that it affects sperm and causes DNA damage. And this is just an example of sperm at the top left after one hour um, and at the bottom that's been exposed to RF radiation and after five hours on the right. And I think if you look at the sperm at the lower right, you can see that those guys aren't doing very well. Now, I wanted to lighten this a little bit, so I'm going to show you a little um, uh, music video, and I hope the sound works, uh, called Nuking Your Johnson. They used to say cell phones gave you cancer, but that was like 15 years ago. You've heard the rumors about brain tumors, but your cell phone company says it ain't so. Once in a while, you get a lecture from your mom. Blah, 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 something said by Dr. Oz. It wasn't nothing about roasting your nuts. Flamboy and your boys, cooking your junk. Oh, you didn't know. How could you know your cell phone's been nuking your 
Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson. Every minute that it's on and in your pants pocket, it's blasting radiation at your love rocket. Thank you very much. <laughs>